Well, welcome to Passage to Profit, everybody. I'm Richard Gerhardt, and this is The Inventor Show. Uh, Gerhardt Law, our sponsor, is a full-service intellectual property law firm. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. I work at Gerhardt Law, but I'm not a lawyer. Do I know you? Uh, <laughs> I think we're related. <laughs> it is now officially summer. We have been doing Passage to Profit on Zoom since March, or April, I think, is when we started doing the Zoom. And our wonderful producer Noah who we love with all our hearts and miss dearly <laughs> takes our takes whatever we can get from zoom and turns it into an actual radio show so thank you Noah. I want to thank him up front and Kenya Gibson is here she is the media maven from iHeart and thank you Kenya for coming I, I just occurred to me that passage to profit has been on the air now almost two years next month yeah and yeah, that's crazy. It's just going by so quickly. It's it's great. Yeah, they haven't kicked us off yet, so <laughs> good sign. <laughs> but we've been seeing people about entrepreneurs and intellectual property now publicly for a couple of years, and uh, it's been a great experience. And yeah, and it's been a great experience for us at iHeart, too. We love having you as part of the iHeart family and a part of our programming. You know, we are a really big platform and produce a lot of content. And this is one of our favorite shows to work with. So thanks for being a part of our family. Thank you. We get amazing people. And again, as you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening on the radio, I can give you a real quick rundown of who we're going to have today. We have Joe Sullivan, who's going to be our presenter. And then we are, our, our, I'm sorry, our guest who we interview. And then we have three presenters, Cheryl, Paul, and Beth. And uh, we'll start with a little bit of, talk about intellectual property and then we'll get on of to the course, rest of the show. Of course, we cannot skip the, um, the trademark terror or the patent palooza part of our show. It's absolutely essential. Right. But before we get going, I promised a friend of mine who's a professor at Montclair State University, her name is Ethne Swartz, that I would let everybody know about this new government program. It's actually a series of lectures by really important people. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the U.S. Commercial Service, and it's a free six-part digital series to acquire skills and tools to boldly expand sales. <laughs> well, boldly, <laughs> boldly gone where no salesperson has gone before. <laughs> into new markets in Canada, Mexico, and beyond. But this is stemming from the new trade treaty between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And it's the USMCA is called is what the agreement's called. So if you go on the USMCA website, that's the United States Commercial Service, you can find that if you want the link to the actual series where you sign up. So the first one is going to be USMCA and Future of Trade in North America on July 28th, August 11th, financing the deal and getting paid, et cetera. There's going to be six of them. Just email us at passage to profit show at gmail.com and we will email you that link so you can register. And by the way, on September 22nd, they're going to have a segment on intellectual property. So if you haven't gotten enough on Passage to Profit, attend the seminar and they'll give you even more good information about uh, intellectual property. And speaking of that, you know, everybody's talking about COVID and the Patent and Trademark Office has had accelerated programs now since the beginning of the pandemic. If you want to get your intellectual property through quicker, and if it's related to the pandemic in some way, they have accelerated programs. They've been doing this for the patents for a while. They just now started doing it with trademarks. And so if you have a trademark that you'd like to file, and it's protecting a brand related to something having to do with COVID, then you file a special petition with the trademark office, and you can get your trademark examined within two months, which is really amazing because normally it takes about a year to get your trademark examined, but um, the Patent and Trademark Office is really trying to help out innovators in this crisis, and so they're moving things along a lot quicker. Yes, so our next IP thing is what we call our Patent Palooza. Yes. <laughs> and I'll introduce this one. So there's this company, it's growing, it's called Flexi World. it's in Oregon, and they have a bunch of patents. They have 10 of them that they are asserting against Amazon. So they are taking Amazon to court. And th what they do is wireless communications. And they are saying that Amazon is infringing their patents for many reasons. And their products like the tablets, like the Fire Tablet. Um, and what they're saying is, 
their output manager software for managing output or rendering of digital content to a wireless output device that they're using on a lot of their devices is infringing their 10 patents. So we will see where this ends up. Yeah, I mean, I hope uh, Amazon does, ends up, you know, striking a deal with this company, assuming that there's any validity to their uh, patent infringement claims, because it'd be a real shame if Kindle or some of the other other products happen to be taken off the market. Uh, one of the things with a patent is it does give you the right to enjoin others from making, using, or selling your invention. And that's a very powerful tool when it comes to, uh, you know, marketing and, uh, you know, maintaining your market share. Um, on the other hand, that said, you know, Amazon is just this huge target. It's like, got a big red bullseye painted on it. They've got so much money that anybody that thinks they have a patent that's even close ends up filing a lawsuit against them. And I guess the courts will just sort it out and I'm sure things will eventually get resolved, but, um, uh, but we'll just uh, have to wait and see and we'll keep you updated on the progress there. So you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeartRadio. We'll be back right after this message. So welcome back, everybody, uh, to Passage to Profit. Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart here. Our special guest this evening is Joe Sullivan from uh, Gorilla76 Marketing. Welcome, Joe. And also joining us for the segment is our media maven, uh, Coach Kenya Gibson. So Kenya's here, too. Good to see you again, Kenya. So, Joe, tell us a little bit about uh, Gorilla76. Gorilla76 is my marketing agency that um, I co-founded back in... July or the seventh month of 06, um, which is what the 76 comes from. The gorilla is um, sort of a, a nod to, to the other spelling of gorilla, gorilla marketing. And you know, the idea of when we got started, it was a lot of, um, you know, working with small businesses to think outside the box and, and you know, figure out how to get in front of the right people and um, get the right message to them. And so that was sort of the inspiration for, for our name. But we're an 18 person firm that has uh, evolved over really the last 14 years and in particular the last seven or eight years into um, we carved out a niche in the industrial sector. So our audience is mid-sized manufacturers, uh, B2B only. Um, and really what we do is help them attract, engage, and drive sales opportunities with the right people from the right companies. Why guerrilla marketing? I mean, it's definitely a name that you would remember, right? And I guess that's one of the reasons for doing it. But is there anything else behind using uh, the, you know, the word guerrilla marketing for your company? Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's just a nod to that idea of, uh, you know, guerrilla spelled, spelled G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. Um, you know, it, guerrilla warfare, trying to do something, you know, out of the box and, and non-traditional. Um, we liked the, the animal as sort of a, you know, a strong metaphor. And we were also at the time, 24 year old guys who knew nothing about starting a business. And um, that's the name we, we picked and it stuck. And so we, better than, than Sullivan Franco marketing, we always say, I'm a little more memorable maybe so. <laughs> I know some marketers talk about this, but we were gonna discuss it today. It was going from me, 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 I, 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 to you, the customer, the client. Uh, how to change your marketing from to really reach out and uh, um, attract and connect with the people that you're trying to reach. So what, what do you think is important for that? How do you make that transition? So the, the natural inclination that people have when they're thinking about how to market themselves, when they're thinking about sales prospecting is to just go straight to this is what we do and how great we are and why our people are the best and why you should buy this and this and this and this from us. And the reality is nobody cares. Nobody cares what you do. Nobody cares what you sell. They care about themselves. They care about the problems they're trying to solve. They care about the things they're trying to achieve in their, in their personal lives and their jobs and the role they have to, to play. Um, they care about the questions they're trying to get answered along the way. And so it's, it's just, it's really counterintuitive to think, well, I'm just going to start talking about myself. Right? So the, the, what we're encouraging, what we encourage companies to do and how we help them is to kind of flip that script and start with the things that the most important buying process influencers at the right types of companies that you're actually trying to reach care about and using your expertise and the expertise, the collective expertise of your team 
um, to create value for them. And that's really what we believe marketing is. It should be creating value, earning trust and attention. And that's your means for starting conversations. So Joe, you know, I work in marketing um, like you. And one of the things that we're seeing with a lot of the advertisers and people that we've been working with is the shift in messaging due to everything that's going on with COVID. So how are you helping the clients that you work with right now reposition themselves in the marketplace uh, with everything that's going on? So I think that everything that's happened with COVID has really just um, put a spotlight on the, on the same problems or amplified them. The, you know, this, this idea that um, you, you, you can't just sit here talking about yourself and blasting a, you know, this, this megaphone in people's ears about how great you are. Um, it's only become that much more true because uh, now everybody's overwhelmed with messages and, and everybody's, you know, so many companies just purely out of, I mean, desperation in some cases, or just the, the need to generate opportunities and business. You know, there's just more and more noise being pushed out there now and, and people are becoming uh, more inclined to, to tune it out. So, uh, you know, things that, that we're recommending, you know, how, how, do, doing things that can humanize yourself. You know, I, I love how everybody's sort of comfortable with video now, right? All of a sudden everybody knows, you know, Zoom is like, the, the word Zoom is the same as, as Kleenex or Xerox in, in this space where it's just, that's the word now for, right, for, for doing a video meeting. And, but everybody's becoming comfortable with it. I have clients who are, you know, people who are in their, their 70s who are, would never have said, I, I would have never thought I'd be picking up, you know, turning on a, a video conference with one of my customers and, and, um, and, you know, working with the manufacturing sector, people who are much more traditional in their communications, embracing this stuff. And it's a great way to humanize yourself. Uh, I want to go back to something that you said earlier too, mm -hmm. especially in these times, you know, there's so much going on and people are hurting and especially when they're hurting and they're uncertain, they have to be heard. And, and so uh, in order, I think, to, to make effects, you know, effective connections with customers, businesses have to take a step forward and really make sure that the people that they're, they're working with are heard and understood because now more than ever, that's what, that's what people need. You know, I just think as if, if you're trying to reach people with your product, with your service, I, I, you, we have to be extra good listeners right now and really put the empathetic piece of ourselves out there so that we can connect. So I agree that the word empathy is so key. I think in, in marketing, it always, always should be, but especially now. For sure. And I was just going to make one little quick point, um, you know, in reference to cause marketing, we're seeing a lot of that now in the marketplace, especially as brands look for ways to, like you were saying, Joe earlier, not create that laundry list of, this is what we do, right? But instead, um, you know, really connecting to causes um, and really doing some cool stuff. Like we just did something really cool with Vic Pens for teachers and like kids learning from home and, and things like that. So, you know, I think what a lot of consumers love, and I, especially me, is I love brands that are connected to causes. So I'm more likely to support those brands because they've made that effort to connect to, you know, what's important and what's going on, especially during these times. This is great. We have to break for a commercial right now, but you are listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, uh, our special guests this evening, Joe Sullivan and Coach Kenya Gibson from iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on WOR 710, the voice of New York. Right before the break, Joe had made a comment uh, before we switched tracks and started talking about empathy and um, you made a really interesting point about everything being at every teleconference now becoming zoom and of course as a trademark person uh, I I hear that and I we think of like all of the trademarks that have become generic over the years so um, you know we we Xerox was a company and that everybody started calling photocopiers Xerox machines and Kleenex is another example of where the trademarks become generic because they're so widely used. And 
I can imagine that the trademark attorneys at Zoom are pulling their hair out right now because they're getting all this fantastic publicity, right? But you can't go and sue people for misusing the name, especially when the people misusing the name are your, are, are potential customers, right? So the last thing you want to do is like sue your customers and there's just too many people out there. So um, yeah. it would be really great to understand kind of what they're, what they're planning in terms of strategy to try to keep that name distinctive as opposed to uh, generic, so. Excellent, so we were discussing marketing and Joe was talking about some of the cutting edge marketing techniques that they're using at Gorilla 76 Marketing. One of them is outreaching to their clients and making it about the client and not about the company. What else can you tell us, especially for people to use right now during quarantine? You know, other ways that you can connect with people in a way that's non-intrusive, that's helpful. Um, you know, I, I think everybody's maybe getting a little sick of webinars at, at this point, but, um, you know, you, there's, audience. there's so many different ways. They love Zoom. They love webinars. I, I just know it. So anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that can be a little bit intimidating too for some people to, you know, dive into a, a more video-based platform. And I think, you know, generally speaking, the, the way to think of it is, it just start by dialing in on um, the type of company you're, you're trying to reach. Um, you know, who, who are the, the customers who are your most profitable customers who you know, are, are the ones you actually want to do business with? And what are the characteristics of those companies? And then think about who are the people inside of those organizations who might influence the buying process. Like for our, our clients who are largely in the manufacturing sector, um, you know, it's, it's often engineers uh, that are trying to, solve a problem on the floor that, that you know, our customers are trying to reach. Um, or it could be you know, plant managers who are trying to figure out how to create efficiencies in their facility. It's CEOs looking at total cost of ownership and ROI and, and issues like this. So if you can look at your customer base and say, who are the, the people inside of the right companies who are going to influence the buying process and what are the things those people actually care about? And then in whatever medium is most comfortable to you, whether that be video or written content or something visual or, or you know, running a podcast or, or whatever, um, so, you know, share your insights, right? Harvest sort of the insights inside your company and use those uh, as a way to engage people. That sounds like a really uh, you know, great strategic approach. So what motivated you to start the agency and what are some of the challenges that you faced as a business co-owner uh, in, in, in running the agency? So I started the firm really as, uh, you know, I, was, I was 24, I guess, when we when I officially quit my job and, and went full time with my business partner, John. Um, and we, you know, I think we both knew we wanted to sort of run our own business. You, I think that was the main motivation, right? Were you experienced in marketing? Did you have a lot of training before you started? A little bit. Um, we, you know, I, I went to school for it, for one, but I, I had worked in, an, in a uh, marketing agency here in St. Louis for about two years. And at the same time, was, we, were, we were doing, I mean, we got to the point where we were, you know, we were doing 40 hours of work outside of work to run our own, uh, start our own business up. So there was a, a period of grind there where we sort of learned on the job. So that's pretty brave, right? Because I, I don't know, when you're in your 20s, you do things, right? You know, but um, that's pretty brave to go, you know, quit a job, go out on your own with, you know, some experience, but not a lot of experience. What, what was the source of confidence for making that kind of move? What, what made you think that uh, you were going to be able to, you know, take this idea and, and run with it, which you obviously have? Sure. Well, probably stupidity was part of it. Um, but, you know, now look, looking at, you know, my life now, I'm 37. I have, I'm married. I have two kids, one's five and one's three. And I have a lot more responsibilities than I did when I was 24 and made this leap. So that certainly helped, right? But we also knew, we also knew what, what we could do. And we looked at inside the companies we were working in and said, we, we can do this on our own. There's, we just need the, we, we need to be introduced to the right people. We need to, uh, you know, build a little client base. And so we kind of did that on the side. You know, it wasn't like we said one day, ah, I'm done with this. I'm going to go just start this thing. We were building it in the, in the nights and the weekends. And we got to a point where we, we had three months of, of income, right? Kind of side hustle kind of thing. Um, I, I always loved marketing. And when I was a kid, I would watch TV commercials 
And I would watch them, I would try to figure out, you know, who are they trying to appeal to? You know, what is the hook? Why are they presenting it this way? Um, I always thought, it, I, I like the commercials usually better than the shows because I was like trying to get in the head of the, the company and trying to figure out who they were, who they were pitching to. So, um, so anyway, so, but you must have had some, some sense of that kind of um, you know, perspective you know, to get started and, 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 and create this can, great agency. Can I ask, what made you choose manufacturing as a, an industry? Sure. So in our earliest days, it was a little bit of anything for anybody who, you know, if somebody's ready to write us a check, we were taking it, right? But um, we, what we found is through our experience with our earliest clients that the companies we were best at, at doing work with were, we liked working with companies who did, who made stuff with their hands or they were, you know, these sort of grittier brands. Um, it fit our personalities. They were companies who we knew we could cr create a lot of impact for because the, the industrial sector was so far behind and you know, they're not traditionally marketing savvy people for the most part. And there was a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there. So once we had some experience there, we decided to just own it and it kind of snowballed. So Joe, are you, are you, a, you're a full service agency for your clients. So what are some of the um, services that you provide? Like is it creative strategy? Is it media placement? Like, what are some of those things? Sure. First and foremost, we're a strategy agency. So our job is to, through whatever means necessary, help our clients figure out how to get from point A to point B um, it, with their business. So we, you know, we start by figuring out how it, it, what the revenue target is, new customer acquisition target is, and then working backwards from there. But our, our core deliverables come usually in the form of content. We, we're really good at, at you know, interviewing people creating content that's helpful in nature for their customers. We're getting more and more into video these days. So um, I, would, I would describe it as, as generating content assets and then figuring out how to get them in front of as many of the right people from the right companies as possible. So what sure. would you advise a startup right now or a, sm a company that maybe started in October like I did? <laughs> <laughs> She's a very into video, by the way. Yeah, but <laughs> right. <laughs> like if you could give one key piece of advice to somebody starting out, what would that be? Yeah. So there are things you're going to do from a marketing perspective that are, are going to help you build your brand for the long term. There are other things that are going to help you produce results quickly. And you kind of need to do both. If you're too, you know, if you have this marketing nearsightedness, um, you're going to be too focused on, on the short term and you're not going to build anything sustainable. So I think you need to, one, you need to start creating a bank of thought leadership content that positions you as the expert practitioner, not talks about yourself, but, but addresses the issues and questions and problems your, your best customers are trying to solve. Um, and if, if you house that on your website and you start building authority for your website, then you can win the search out engine optimization game in the long term. but that doesn't happen overnight. So that same content, you can amplify through paid media, through outbound, reaching out to people and delivering that directly to them. So I think it's that combination. You're mostly B2B, right? Yeah. Or B2C. So do you have any experience in B2C? I, I, the, what I'm trying to ask is, is like, well, what's kind of the difference between B2B versus B2C marketing in, in your opinion? Yeah, in a lot of ways, I think B2B is, you know, at least that, that from our experience, you're often dealing with committees of buyers. You're dealing with more complex solutions that have longer buying processes. It's almost more comparable to in the B2C world, buying a house or a car in a lot of cases where, you know, there are a few people involved here. You're not going to just show up someday and make a purchase. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think a lot of consumer B2C advertising tends to be maybe a little more impulsive um, or shorter, shorter buy cycles, talking to one person, maybe a little emo more emotion involved in, in the purchasing decision. But, you know, my, my experience really is in, in B2B, so I can't speak too much to, to the B2C side of things. No, that's really a great explanation and uh, very informative. I've never heard it put that way, but it makes you know, perfect sense. So thank you, Joe. We have to uh, move on to a commercial, but we'll be right back. This is Passage to Profit, and we'll be back after this message. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on WOR 710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Joe Sullivan, and our media maven, Coach Kenya. And it's my turn to say a little bit about Fireside, the company I started last October. Yeah, and why don't you tell us 
again, what about the project and what you're doing and what, what the project's all about? Well, you know, it's changed a little <laughs> with COVID, uh, but I'm soldiering on. So Fireside is a video directory of small businesses. And I envision, my vision has changed a couple of times. Right now I envision it as a Wikipedia of small business using video. So any small business that wants to be on this web, it's a YouTube channel and a website. Any small business that wants to be on there can. I've been conducting the interviews myself um, because what I found doing Passage to Profit is that for somebody to stand in, I can't, it goes to what Joe was saying, for somebody to stand in front of a camera and go, uh, my name is Elizabeth Gearhart, I have Passage to Profit and Fires, I, you know, it's, it's hard. And if you're talking to somebody, it's much more natural. And I can say things about people in the interviews that they wouldn't necessarily say about themselves. Like I had one woman who won a Grammy and she never wanted to talk about it, or an Emmy, I'm sorry, an Emmy. She never wanted to talk about it, but I could talk about it, right? So I do these short interviews with people. I put them on my YouTube channel. I put them on my website. And I started with lawyers and once COVID hit and everything went upside down in our world, I expanded it to all small business. Yeah. I mean, and we were, we were actually talking about it. We're been interviewing some candidates for a particular job here at uh, Gearheart Law. And I spoke with both of them via Zoom yesterday and neither of them were right for us. The energy was just not there. Nonetheless, I spent an hour interviewing each person, whereas if I had had a video directory, I probably would have picked up on the energy issue right off the bat, and I could have moved on to somebody who I thought would be a better fit for our organization. So, And in um, fact, I showed Richard a video of somebody I thought he might consider, and he said, that's not exactly what I'm looking for in five minutes. I'm very picky, by the way. So, but uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea. And... Uh, it, it's, it's getting a lot of great feedback. So where, where can they find Fireside? Oh, it's fireside.directory, but you have to put it in the top browser bar with the HTTPS because it's so new. Um, and it's also a YouTube channel, Fireside Directory. It's a blue flame is the logo, which my dear friend and mentor, Kenya, helped me <laughs> with. She's the one who designed, pretty much designed the logo for me um, and found the tagline, Igniting Connections. And anybody that wants, if any of you want to be on the site, you're more than welcome to. So it's fireside.directory. And I'm. And it's have, free for right now. It's free. It's free to do the video. It's free what to be on lose? the site. Um, I'll be starting to charge a subscription fee maybe next year. We'll see how the economy is for people. Um, and I have, I've got a lot of people on there and I'm getting more and more. I have a bunch of interviews this week. So Way it's to growing. Go. Way to go. So, thank you for the update, and now we're on to the presenter portion of the program, uh, the part you've all been looking forward to. Our first presenter this evening is Paul Cunningham, and Paul is from Leatherhead Sports. So, Paul, tell us about your project and your company, and uh, you have two minutes to present, so go. Thank you for having me. Um... Yes, Leatherhead Sports is a company I started several years ago, uh, and essentially I'm a leather leather craftsman uh, focusing on leather sports balls. My um, you know my niche is uh, is sports. There's a lot of leather workers out there, and they do a lot of uh, you know handbags and that sort of thing. But uh, Leatherhead Sports specifically is um, you know focused on leather, uh, vintage style, historic, nostalgic leather sports balls. You know, I have a background in uh, sports and sports uh, licensing. Um, and Leatherhead Sports was something that uh, was really a hobby that kind of, that got out of hand that I, you know, essentially turned into a, into a full business. Uh, you know, as an example, I don't know how visually um, relevant this is, but this is an example of, you know, one of our footballs. So Paul is holding up a football and a baseball. Or is it a softball or, oh. Uh. This is a lemon, lemon peel style baseball. It's really uh, 1860s version. This is the sort of the first, the first baseball. And for those of you who are listening to this, you, you'll be able to see it on our social media. You'll be able to go to his website to see these, but they're absolutely beautiful. They're like Sherlock Holmes of inventions, kind of like that era almost, you know, they're, they 
they're wonderful. Are these machine made? Do you make them each? Do you have, where do you have them made? How do you do it? Well, I have a, uh, a shop in, in Glen Rock, New Jersey, uh, and a handful of employees. You know, during COVID, I, I had to furlough people, uh, but slowly starting to bring people back. But we, made, we manufacture everything here in our shop in Glen Rock, uh, suburban New Jersey. It's, uh, it's labor intensive. I buy leather from tanneries, American tanneries generally. Um, you know, design patterns over the years. We, we cut the leather we, and then we assemble everything here. Uh, we do a lot of custom work. Uh, we work, in, you know, we do a lot of individual custom balls for people, but we also work with uh, with companies, uh, corporations, and and um, uh, you know, so we have a B to B to B and a B to C component to what we do. I have a sports radio background. I used to work with the Yankees and the New York Giants, so I, I have an appreciation for sports memorabilia, and I'm I'm a big sports person. So how are you? How are people finding out about? the products that you make and, and how are you reaching like sports enthusiasts? Uh, interesting. I don't necessarily um, target sports enthusiasts per se. And when I say that, I mean like the, the professional sports fan, uh, the sports enthusiast that loves to play sports is really more of my customer. Um, I, over the years, I've done a bunch of different things, started off appealing to bloggers. You know, I got good blog coverage. My best results have always been very PR oriented. Um, and then, you know, that, that kind of waned a bit. Print media was always really good about 10 years ago, but print media isn't as relevant for me anymore. Um, right now, I'm doing a lot with social media, specifically Instagram, because Instagram is so visually oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick for me is just just to being able to evolve with with the platform. Um, you know, when I first started, Instagram was just still photography oriented, and now it's uh, really it seems like the algorithm is favoring video. So my evolution from uh, from taking still photography to try and get a little more video involved uh, is, is uh, you know, it's how I'm reaching people. That's great. Okay. So are these, um, are these uh, balls, are they meant to be used and played with or are they more display items or is it just really up to the purchaser? Great question. It's, um, you know, when I do trade shows, the question I often get is what is it? And people recognize that it's a sports ball, but they're really asking what's it being used for. Uh, they're designed to be played with. The leather that I use is very sturdy. It's designed to age beautifully. It's just, you know, it's designed, uh, these are designed to be played with. I was surprised to see a basketball made out of leather like that. Do people actually use that? And what, do you do all kinds of balls? Like every uh, Yes, yes, we do all kinds of balls. Um, the football really is the, the most playable. The basketball, it's a, it's a Naismith vintage style basketball that, uh, you know, it's got a lace on it. It's a little bit heavier, definitely geared more toward display, but it certainly bounces and you certainly can play with it. I make rugby balls. I make uh, a couple different varieties of baseballs, a uh, couple different sizes of footballs. We make a lot of and sell a lot of medicine balls, which have been very popular during quarantine. Yeah. Medicine balls being, you know, big exercise balls. Uh, but that's that's our niche. Our niche is sports balls in the in the leather leather goods field. So, what's the difference between uh, going to Models and buying a basketball versus or or football versus you know coming to like what what is besides the leather like what are the benefits of you know buying one of your balls versus you know just going to Models and picking up a regular old ball to play well, with? Well, the first difference really, of course, is price. Um, you know, the stuff at Models is, uh, for the most part, manufactured cheaply in China, um, mass produced uh, with cheap labor. Um, you know, the sort of the, I guess the genesis of the idea was trying to take beautiful leather and translate that into, you know, into a, into a sports ball. Use the sports ball as a, the sculptural form of the sports ball mm -hmm. to showcase beautiful leather. And, um, you know, price, it's, you know, it's really expensive to manufacture uh, this type of thing in suburban New Jersey. 
um, you know, I'm buying the top quality leather, buying top quality materials. Um, you know, it's really rare to find this type of manufacturing in the United States. That's why I have such a, uh, such a tight niche. It's a, a niche that I, I largely own in the U.S. Nobody's really manufacturing sports balls this way. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not standardized for competitive play, but they certainly are designed for, for play. My question, um, just out of curiosity, like I, I played basketball all, all through high school. It was, it was like my life growing up and, and I love the, um, I, I love the vintage side of this. Um, I'm just kind of curious what, you know, for people who are, are true, you know, you kind of said the basketballs are sort of more for display, but for the other balls, people really like getting their hands dirty with these things, playing with them and, um, even though it's it's a little different, it's more premium. Yes, I mean, it, you know, the the like I was saying before, the leather ages beautifully. It develops a patina over time, and that's really only be, going to become evident when you play with it. Uh, you know, a, a standard sports ball uh, is not going to age the same way. These <laughs> things really are about connecting. You know, like a grandfather may buy one so that he can have a catch with his, with his grandson. Uh, I designed them a little bit smaller for sort of universal use. Uh, you know, I want to be able to, you know, women, men, boys, girls, I want everyone to be able to use these things. And I want, and it's really about, uh, it's a nostalgic thing. It's about connecting people. So, Paul, when, they, when you're putting these balls together, you're, you're sewing them together, right? They have seams. Are the, are the seams uh, done by hand or are they done by machines? Or and Depends on the ball. Like a baseball, this is hand-stitched. Hmm. Um, How long does it take to, to make a baseball like that? How long does it take a, a, a skilled stitcher to stitch that? Uh, about 10 minutes to stitch it. Um, you know, there's other steps in the process, cutting, die cutting the leather and that sort of thing. Um, Along those lines, Paul, I wanted to ask you, what kind of custom orders do you get? Because I see you said you do a number of custom items. What do people want and how do they, how do you customize it? Lots of ways. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's a monogram. Sometimes it's a corporate logo. Uh, this you can see kind of reverse is a corporate logo. Um, it, you know, we do work for the White House. I've worked for two administrations of the White House. So we put the presidential seal on the ball. Um, and this goes, this is going back about uh, 10 years now. Um, so it's, you know, it's really any entity that appreciates the craft. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we can emboss, uh, like I said, uh, corporate logos or, or monograms. Can you make the different sizes if you wanted to or are, is that just to some extent we have you know i have a two sizes of footballs i have a pro size and i have a, a another size you know a, a smaller size um basketballs i have three different sizes i have big a big one you know it's a, uh, an official size but i also have uh, many basketballs uh that are good for you know just banging around on a smaller hoop inside every time i do a new design it's a big process you know Rescaling, you've got to design patterns. You've got to design, uh, you know, you got to get cutting dies made. So I, I have to. If I'm going to do a new ball or a new size, I have to balance that with if I think the market exists for it. So, Paul, oh, just speaking of the market, real, really quick, um, because of everything that's going on with COVID, uh, families are spending a lot more time together. People are being a lot more recreational. I actually went and bought a bike. A few weeks ago, I haven't owned a bike in a, in a long time. Are you finding you're benefiting from sales because people are more looking for just regular recreational opportunities to stay active and spend time together? Hugely, hugely. I mean, oddly enough, my April sales were the best that I've ever had. I, you know, my April sales were, you know, um, I think there's a sense of nostalgia. There's in uncertain times, people gravitate toward nostalgic things. I sold a lot of medicine balls because people were working out at home. Um, and there's no question, uh, this quarantine has been a real boost for my business. It's kind of a, two sides to that though. I had to let go and fur furlough my people for several months. So, 
you know, I was doing all of the work myself, but it, uh, but business was, was way up. It's been really fascinating to see that. We have to wind up this segment, unfortunately. If you want something made in the USA, handmade, it sounds like a lot of times, custom made in the USA, here in New Jersey, Leatherhead Sports, go there. And it's, I think it's an excellent gift for a sports fan who you don't know what to get them. Like this would have been great for Father's Day for some people and birthdays and football season. You can get somebody. I'm, and they are beautiful. I've been to the website. They're gorgeous. So leatherheadsports.com. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's great. And we'll be back with another presenter right after this message. Welcome back to Passage to Profit, everyone. This is The Inventor Show with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Our special guest this evening is Joe Sullivan and, of course, Ken Gibson, our media maven. Uh, coming up next, we have Cheryl, and Cheryl is going to be talking about the panic aid. And Cheryl, you have two minutes. Go. My journey's been a long one. I uh, personally have suffered from panic disorder for like 28 years. Son inherited. Uh, but at the time, I didn't know what to do about it. Then my daughter, at age 14, 15, she's now 16, almost 17, um, and all the doctors wanted to do was like, here's Xanax, or here's Clonopin, or, you know, here's more drugs. And I'm not saying that they don't work. Don't misinterpret that. I'm just saying that at that age, with their hormones and everything else, I, I didn't want that to happen. So I, two years ago, changed everything. I got rid of all of our savings, put it all into this, and I created Panic Aid, an anxiety aid, and a PM version. And basically, it's a two ounce shot that you simply drink when you feel that panic coming on, and it takes you from that 500 miles an hour to a more level, I can breathe, I can feel my heart rate dropping, I, I can control where I'm at mentally. Um, I am very careful because of marketing um, to be sure that I, we're not a cure. I don't claim to be. We don't predict or prevent anxiety or panic attacks. This is, uh, my son says this the best, it's a tool in your arsenal to battle anxiety and panic attacks. That's its purpose. And it's portable. It's, uh, I know they won't be able to see this, but it's just a simple two ounce you could drink half or whole, depending on your metabolism, and um, it's it's been it's been great because I hid behind that veil of no one needs to know what I'm really going through, and I'm a very good at the dog and pony show. I can pretend better than anybody, but you know behind the scenes it was hell. And dropping that veil and sharing with people changed my life as well as my kids. And uh, we've gotten very involved with uh, suicide crisis and prevention. But my goal with this product isn't about messer and making the money. It's about helping people and starting a charity where people's mental health is paid for. It is very expensive to get counseling. It is very expensive to get, if you're bipolar, let's say, like my husband is, that medication is not cheap. It's $1,200 a month. That's not cheap. Um, most people can't afford that. Heck, we can't. We had to fill out paperwork to get that. But my point is, drugs aren't always the solution. Uh, Xanax does make you more anxious when you come off of it. So I just wanted something you can keep with you. Uh, we've got anxiety aid, which I give to a lot of first responders and they use that when they get home from a long day. I've got a lot of officers that use it and they just need to calm down when they, you know, and unplug their brain from all that. But it's, uh, it's been amazing. I've learned a lot in reference to uh, science and mixing ingredients together and we made it a drink because a lot of people when they have panic their throats close up or they become nauseous and you popping pills or counting isn't really going to happen you want something simple to do so this is simple you basically unscrew it and drink it it doesn't get any easier so what's in this magic potion you would appreciate this it's not patented <laughs> Because what people told me was, uh, like, look at an energy drink. I won't say the name. That's been copied by changing one or two ingredients. And then it's not the same formula. So 
Our formula is a base same of magnesium, L-theanine, ashwagandha, 5-HTP, lavender, chamomile. Um, Anxiety Aid has absolutely nothing to do with CBD because it's a very bipolar product, I call it, because people love it or it's pot. And they don't want nothing to do with it. And I totally get it. I, I totally respect that. And I understand where we are today with that. So Anxiety Aid is just that, but it still works. Uh, Panic Aid has a little, a little kiss of it. And PM has a lot more of it. But you will sleep. And it'll bring, it'll shut this off wow. from going 5 million miles an hour. <laughs> wow. I, I'm like blown away because I'm like, you're over here reading my mail with all, uh. these, uh, <laughs> 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 with all these symptoms. And I think even now with just the way everything has been, I think we're all a little more anxious. I mean, I know before COVID happened, I, I always had problems sleeping, um, but because I have a million things going on in my brain and it's hard for me to shut down. So I, I definitely, I need to try this because I'm really um, anti-medication and very, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to take anything. So. It, it, it took me a year to formulate it. And, you know, my son is very active with me on this because I made it, they forced me to face it, if that makes sense. And um, we had it be dummies, so to speak, your guest dummies, you had to actually kept trying it until you found the right version of it. But um, my biggest thing with, with marketing is I don't want to look like I'm piggybacking on Corona or that I'm trying to sell something because of that. This is, Corona has made it worse, like you said, Kenya. I mean, I've got, I've asked people and 89% said Corona made it worse or introduced them to anxiety or panic. But that's why I talk with counselors and psychologists and I have them, we do a show every Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I gear a lot toward kids just because the suicide rate has gotten so bad with our teens because they don't know how, they don't understand that a panic attack doesn't make you crazy. You're not going to be locked up in a, you know, funny farm with your arms tied behind your back. And that's the vision they have or that they can't handle it. So panic aid was just kind of that, that one little thing here. Is there a difference between panic and just generalized anxiety? Is your product for treating people who are really just having a, just this burst of, of, of panic, maybe they're claustrophobic and they find themselves in a closet or something, or versus just general anxiety that is uncomfortable? Uh, would, would it, does it treat both or is it really just focused on the, you know, the panic? It started with Panic Aid just for the fact that that's where I lived personally. I have horrible panic attacks. My son, so much better now, but at that age, 15 through 19, it was hell. Um, and a lot of boys go through that, but they don't know that. Um, my daughter and her friends as well. So I, I started with Panic Aid, and yes, in answer to your question, it is geared toward when you feel that coming on, and, and if you've had a panic attack, you know when it's coming on. You drink it and it'll save you from going completely off. Anxiety aid is a um, less strong version and it is for, I've got cheerleaders who take it before they perform because they've got stage fright. I've got people in California that are actresses that take it because they get a little <laughs> before they walk out. So it goes either way. Um, and then the PM is just, it's the end of the day and you want to shut your head off and it won't cooperate. Everything you did for the day, you have to do tomorrow is blah, blah. So. So it sounds like this is made from all tested ingredients, like normal things that you would find, but it's the way that you put them together is what makes the difference, right? So everything's safe, in other words, in here. Yes, ma'am. I still say to go ask your doctor if you're pregnant or anything like that. Yes, you can. Um, you. You're welcome. Um, I do have one friend that is actually allergic to ashwagandha, which I personally had not heard, but it doesn't mean it's not real. So I have a full list of ingredients. You can look through them and make sure that you're not allergic. But yes, in answer to your question, they all were tested. I have a doctor I work with, a medical doctor that sells it because he knows magnesium is very important with calming you down. Ashwagandha, very important. Chamomile, lavender, they're all together. And the best part, it's in a drink, 
which means it's bioavailable. This stuff hits me in six minutes. Now it takes my husband 15, but he's, you know, six, three. So it's a metabolism thing. That's why I say take half for the whole. Now, I want some right now. So we're going <laughs> I'm the same. Um, I'm not even joking. Like I need it like yesterday because you know, I just uh, feel like I will. I will. Uh, you'll have this, but my brain, <laughs> my brain after. <laughs> it's amazing. I, oh, I was going to ask you, Cheryl. What's your distribution like? Are, are, is, are you in stores? Are you online? I am not in stores, and the reason why is because I've been I've been cautious and careful to keep it cheap, meaning I'm not making anything. I make maybe 80 cents a bottle if I'm lucky. I made it inexpensive because I don't want anyone to not take it because it's you know a $20 bottle. Anxiety Aids, $4.99, Panic Aids, $5.99, PM, $6.99, and I'm still trying to work that down lower because I don't want anyone to not be able to get it. And I've given away tons more than right. I have sold. <laughs> Cheryl, where do we buy it? So is it from um, You can get it on panicaid.com and it's aid with an E. You can get it on Etsy and you can get it on Amazon. We're even on Amazon Prime with Anxiety Aid. So it just, it depends where you're at. Uh, you can read our reviews. I'm very transparent with our story. I love what Joe said in reference to, I call that putting a face on my brand, meaning I am not good selling me, but I'm great at helping others where they're hurting. And um, that's how I put the face on it. I have people tell their story of how it helped them as opposed to me, hey, this is me, this is me. One of the questions I, I guess I had was, how challenging is it for you to market a product like this? You know, are there FDA regulations and things like that you got to navigate around? Um, I was just kind of curious. Yes, sir, a hundred percent. It's uh, it's under the guidance of nutraceutical, which is a very, I call it a gray area in the world because it's very gray. Um, that's why I worked in television for many years. Uh, so I'm over anal about critiquing my process and making sure that we're triple tested, not just from the people I buy the stuff from, but then when I get it, I test it because I don't want their, if you have a news camera coming in, we're going to make sure we're covered. But Yes, I make sure we put all the FDA guidelines on our websites. They're on the bottles. And I, we're not a cure, a prevention, or a prediction, but we're here when you need us. That's, that's who we are. So you can find this P-A-N-I-C-A-I-D-E. So that's the E at the end. Don't leave that off. Panic Aid, and you'll, you'll see it on our website, and uh, I'm going to go buy it after we're done. <laughs> You're listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on WOR 710. We'll be right back. You're listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show. Don't panic. We have one presentation left. Right. So if you are just tuning in, this has been just a great, great show. Marketing expert, a couple of really unique, incredible products. And we're on to our last person who is amazing. You can't miss that, of course, but the podcast comes out tomorrow. So catch the podcast if you missed the show. But I am so happy to be able to introduce now Beth Knight. Welcome, Beth. Tell us about what you do. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you and with everybody. It's been great. And we're going to switch gears a little bit because I talk about cocktails. So I don't know. If I, yeah, that's the reaction I always get. Cocktails. You know, I've been in the health and wellness industry for about 15 years. Uh, a food blogger, I've been a Dr. Oz blogger, I've been in plenty of magazines. Um, 2017, I decided to write a book and it's all about healthy cocktails. Taking your favorite cocktails and make it, remaking them with nutrient dense ingredient, herbs, spices, fruits and vegetable juices, all healthy whole foods to not only, not only notch up your nutrition but make you feel good after you have a cocktail. Because we know that dreaded hangover is not where we want to end up. So, so we I, cocktails have alcohol in them, right? These are yes, not regular cocktails, like your regular Bloody Mary, your regular mojito, whatever your favorite cocktail is, just remade with whole, fresh, real ingredients, so that your the nutrients are going into your body no matter what you're doing. I always say you can you know work out at the gym all week, do really well at the table, but if you're drinking three margaritas on the weekend, you have ruined everything you've done. Right. No. Great advice. So. Give us a little flavor of some of these cocktails. Well, my favorite cocktail is the day drinker, 
which is great during Corona. Uh, it's sage, sure. lemon, grapefruit, gin. So it's got that great citrus. So you do have some of the, you have the vitamins from the citrus. Sage has great antioxidants in it. Grapefruit, as you know, is great for detoxifying. And then gin, which is made from herbs and spices. So it all works together in, in moderation. <laughs> So, so what you do is add back some of the vitamins that the alcohol makes us leach out when we're drinking it, right? So, or we're exactly. processing it, I, I should say. Yeah, it's, there, it's no processed cocktail. So if you're drinking a cocktail maybe with blue carousel in it, or even the triple sec, or even the, the simple syrup they put into it, if you recreate that with a honey syrup or different herbs and spices, you can have that same great taste and really enjoy that cocktail. And knowing that you're not putting any dyes or any chemicals into your system. It's a real difference, but you're leading a healthy lifestyle. Because I've been in, in nutrition and helping people with their wellness for a long time. And the question I would always get was, well, I, great, I'll you know, eat my salad, I'll have my chicken breast and whatever they're doing, but when can I have a cocktail? And that's really what inspired the book. Um, and I have a co-writer with, with me on the book. And that's what inspired us was to help those people who are being healthy to continue being healthy, um, just in a slightly different way. And so now you can drink your salad and get your cocktail on at the same time. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Kimmy, got it. And it's really fun talking about cocktails. And I, oh. I really talk a lot about how I got the book made and the persistence and perseverance it took within myself to get it made. Um, and, I, and I work a lot with small businesses on, their, uh, on media and publicity. As a result from really just having the book published, how I got it published with no social proof, without 50,000 followers, and, and the journey that took me to be in good housekeeping, to be on, you know, morning television shows and to be featured in the Oprah magazine. What's wow. the name of your book? It's, I have it right here. It's called Clean Cocktails, Righteous Recipes for the Modern Mixologist. And the, one of the things that makes our book different is that you can find every ingredient in the book in your local bodega, grocery store, corner store. That was really important to us. Are you doing a podcast or a show or anything? <laughs> I've been recording. It hasn't been released yet. But yeah, are you calling it Righteous Recipes? Because I think that's like an amazing name. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you haven't trademarked it, you might want to talk to Richard. Yeah, you should definitely talk to <laughs> I Richard. Will. I will. I will. Absolutely. So, do the cocktails really taste the different because they have healthier ingredients? Is that like a noticeable uh, difference in flavor from sort of the old cocktails, the the old standard ones? A thousand percent. They're crisper, they're cleaner. And also when your brain's in it, when your head's in it, your mindset's in it, that you're doing something better for yourself while drinking the cocktail. And we talk a lot about the, the community around cocktails, experiencing the cocktail, not just downing a couple of vodka sodas. There's a big difference mm -hmm. between really enjoying your cocktail, looking at it, having a real garnish on it, understanding why you have a garnish on it, um, but really experiencing the pleasure of having a cocktail with a friend or by yourself. But I want to also highlight that in the book, we have a whole chapter on mocktails. So you don't need to be a drinker to partake in the clean cocktail revolution. So are you selling the mix itself? Um, or just, no. just, no? Just the book. You can make your own honey syrup. You can make your own jalapeno syrup or your own bitters. It's really easy. And my focus on being in health and wellness was getting you to do those little simple things to really upgrade yourself and not be handed it. So what about calories? How do uh, you know, healthy cocktails stand up against the old, older ones? Well, if you would get a margarita at a chain or even a regular restaurant where they use the mix, there could be between 50 and 75 grams of sugar. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't eat 50 or 75 grams of sugar in a day. So having one cocktail, that's a lot. The cocktails that we make, it's under 10. So you're, you're taking out the high caloric ingredients and, put it, and putting other ingredients in there low calorie. You know, sage, grapefruit, and lime and lemon don't have a lot of calories. And you're only using, if you're making a cocktail, you're only using about four to six ounces of drink itself anyway. Well, most of the calories in a cocktail come from the alcohol, right? Or is it 50-50 ingredients? Well, Depends on what you're making, right? But depends on, like if you're, so we, we want you to use vodka, gin, tequila, and bourbon. Those are the four low-calorie spirits. If you're using rum or something in that vein, then it's, it's, rum is made from sugar, so that's high sugar. So we don't recommend using those spirits. 
Um, the spirits that I personally like is tequila and gin, and those are the lowest with the highest nutrient value in them as well. I think it's it's really interesting how you've been able to to build this uh, to build pub- publicity for yourself organically. It sounds like I'm I'm just kind of curious uh, if you could touch on a few few ways you've done that because I think it's something that a lot of small business owners are facing. How do we get out there? Thank you so much, and that's what I coach people on is now is how to really do that. And I first we start in collaboration. There is somebody in your I, I used to say Rolodex that's aging myself, but in your list, in your contact list that knows somebody that knows somebody in media. I don't care where you live, where you come from, you know somebody that can help you. So I, like when I first started doing the book, I literally put on my Facebook page, who knows somebody at NBC in New York City? People want to help. So just enrolling your audience and what your goals are and asking for that, it's, it, it gets laid out in front of you. It really does. It's the magic that I've seen happen for people that work with me is that things just happen or opportunities come from different opportunities. And if you start with that collaboration and wanting to bring success to everybody, it really, really works. Uh, that's one and really putting yourself out there on, on social media and telling your story. Like Joe, you're talking about before, you know, I'm telling my story of how I'm creating my business, but I'm bringing you along for the ride and I'm asking your opinion. And I'm even sometimes asking for your help. So now we're a community of people who have small businesses who are trying to be successful together. That's really great. I love your approach. I mean, I think if you want something, ask for it. And putting it out there like that is 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 perfect. And uh, it, it's obviously working. I'm trying to get my next hit. You know, July 4th is coming up. Cocktails are coming up. I'm starting to send out, you know, we're about a week out and I want to do local news for the July 4th. And we're starting to, to get some stuff out. I did send about 100 emails last week and following up. Wow. It's about that hustle. And then wow. in the meantime, I'm really trying to get the word out about increasing the nutrients in your cocktails is a smart way to go, especially since COVID, we're just calling it hashtag cocktails against COVID. So we can all fight the good fight being home together um, and being healthy and maybe not gaining that COVID 15 or 19. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think my kids that are in their twenties, uh, my daughter's 24, my son's 28. I think they would love this. You know, I, I really think this is something they would do with their friends and do at their parties. I so many times I've been in events, or I've done a lot of talking. I'm always out there talking in New York City and New Jersey talking. Um, and the, my favorite is when a mom who looks like me comes up and says to me, my son's in the city and I went to his apartment and your book was on the coffee table. Oh, I know your book. My daughter already gave me a copy. And it's a, millennials like it and they're giving it to their parents. My friends like it. My parents' friends like it. There really isn't a, a distinct demo for it because if you want to have your own home bar or be at home and be able to create something great, maybe you don't like to cook, but you like to make cocktails. So it really helps you on all those. I would love for everyone to get a copy. You know, Since COVID, I would ask everyone to please call their local bookstore. They can order it. Bookstores across the country and actually around the world have it in stock. It is on Amazon and Barnes & Noble as well. Um, but I would say look, support your local first. Well, this has been great. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the segment, but uh, Beth, it's really been a lot of fun talking about healthy ways to make cocktails. Uh, You're on the, you're on the cutting edge there and uh, we want to give you all the support that we can. So thanks a lot for coming on the show. You're listening to Passage to Profit, Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt here with Joe Sullivan and Kenya Gibson. We'll be right back after this message. Well, we've come to the end of our presentations this evening, and they were all outstanding, weren't they? They were, and I was just saying that I didn't know that any of these things exist if we hadn't done the show, but I hope that people with help from people like Joe and Kenya can make everybody know that these things exist because they're fascinating. Yeah, and I love the presentations. I learned a lot, but I'm slightly more confused now than when I began the show because if I have a panic attack, I don't know whether I should take panic aid or have a healthy cocktail or go out and play with a leather ball. But all of those are options now, and I guess I just have to sort through all three of them and figure out what is the best. So if you're just tuning in, um, you can hear this on the podcast tomorrow. It's Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show. But I want to recap who we had on the show. So we had marketing expert with Gorilla76 Marketing, Joe Sullivan. Joe, do you want to spell your website for people? Sure. It's Gorilla, like the animals, G-O-R-I-L-L-A, and then 76.com. And they started out as younger guys. They're still young in my mind. (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> so very full of energy and creative, fresh ideas and cutting edge and really can help you market for the new millennium, this millennium. Uh, we also had Kenya Gibson with us, who is our media maven at iHeart. So if you're interested in media opportunities at all, you should definitely get a hold of Kenya. She's the one who got us this show. It was her brainchild and she's the most. And she's extremely creative. She is. Oh, I appreciate that guys. So oh, she is the most creative. Down. She is the best creative person I've ever met. She's a creative genius. And I'm saying that I mean it. I've said it before. So then we had really uh, some cool products. So we had Paul Cunningham with Leatherhead Sports. So these are made in America, made here in New Jersey. They're high-end sports balls made from leather, but very custom crafted. So, and, but usable too. Uh, so go to his website, leatherheadsports.com and see what he has. And you can get something custom made if it's, you want. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a website for leatherheads, right? It's for people who like leather, right? So <laughs> don't sports. get confused. And sports. Uh, and then we had Cheryl, who has said, I don't have to try to pronounce her last name, um, with Panic Aid, P-A-N-I-C-A-I-D-E. So she has three formulations of all safe ingredients, for people who experience panic attacks and anxiety. And it's really helped her. She has a lot of anecdotal evidence about how these things have really helped people regain control of their emotions. And great Amazon reviews too. And, so and, definitely yeah. check it out um, if you're looking for ways to treat panic. So And then if you like to drink, but you don't like to drink a lot of sugar or a lot of unhealthy stuff with your alcohol, we have Beth Nidick at bethnidick.com and she has recipes for cocktails that are actually healthy which i'd never realized never even thought about before but instead of like taking these sugary mixes full of all sorts of chemicals she's never heard of and dumping them in your alcohol you make the drink yourself with things that are from the grocery store but that put nutrients back into your body instead of sucking them all out yeah i mean healthy <laughs> healthy cocktails i think medical studies show a few drinks a day are actually good for you so um, and these will be even better for you. So uh, lots of exciting recipes to try. And she has a book. So what was the name of the book again? Clean Cocktails, Righteous Recipes for the Modern Mixologist. And so uh, thank you all for coming. I, I, I know it's hard doing these things over Zoom and we're in COVID, but this has been fantastic. Absolutely. And before we go, Joe, do you have any final words for our audience? Sure, yeah. I think, I think what I'd leave the audience with is... Um, you know, during, during a time like this where people are, are, have a lot of concerns, there's, you know, they're, they're struggling, trying to figure out their way through this, uh, you know, from a marketing perspective, if you're a small business owner, you know, just, just think about what ways you can help, how you can use your expertise to provide value rather than just sort of blasting a message at people that they don't want to hear right now anyway. Great. Kenya, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure. I think, you know, one thing that all of these, these products and these brands have in common are they're helping people cope with COVID, right? So I think, you know, this is a time where everybody just kind of needs to stay creative. Um, and somebody should ask, actually could be a good show coping with COVID we're <laughs> because I feel like there's a lot of um, solutions and things out there that people are looking for uh, in terms of resources and ways that they can help you know, get through these times. So I love that all of these products and, and brands are, are helping people, you know, get through these uncertain times for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Very and well said, I thought. Yes, absolutely. And, and we are doing a show every week on Zoom. So you can join us next week for another Passage to Profit show with another excellent speaker and more incredible products and companies you wouldn't have heard about maybe anywhere else. You never know what you're going to get on Passage to Profit. And if you want to be on the show, you just need a good microphone and a good connection to the internet and headphones preferably and because we have to have good sound quality because it can't go on the radio if it doesn't sound good. Um, but Come on if you have a product. Uh, email us at passage to profit show at gmail.com. Yep. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeartRadio, WOR 710, the voice of New York.